We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere is Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It is the last Wednesday of April, which means it's time for another AMA or Ask Us Anything. Tonight, instead of tacking one of the many questions our fan have written in with, we'll be answering questions live from our chat room. All right, now we're here to answer your game and game night topics, but I do want this to be an actual AMA. So really, you can ask us anything. If you want to know more about Sean or I or something not game related, feel free to ask. All right, well, we're going to start off today with a chat uh, question we got from Math Guy Dave in our Discord, our patron only Discord, uh, because he wasn't uh, going to be able to make it tonight. And he wants to know what are some newish games, because he knows we're not about the new hotness, but what are <laughs> some newish games that you want to try? Uh, the big one was we were talking about it a little earlier in the show is Tapestry. I would really like to try that game. Uh, it sounds really fascinating. It was its super hot debut. Everyone was talking about the game. It shot up the board game geek rankings really quickly. And it is not what I thought it was going to be, which is why I just didn't rush out and buy it. I, I am not completely sold on the hype and what I've seen that I will love this game or not. So I really want to try it. This is where it, it's hurting that I can't go to the local game store because I would be begging the local store to do a demo night for this game so I could try it out with the caveat that, hey, if I enjoy it, I'm going to buy a copy. Because it looks like the kind of game I like, but I'm just not sure. Because it's not quite the theme I thought it was. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and there's there's so much right now. Uh, one of the interesting ones that I have seen people, uh, I think it's Kickstarter right now, is Canvas. Which is that the painting okay. game of layers where you're, you're layering uh, tra semi-transparent -tra uh, sheets on things to build up a, a beautiful painting. Cool. Uh, I've seen a couple people I know kickstarting that that one looks and like again it's another one of those ones where i don't know if i'd back it because it's a right. little on the artsy side necessarily for me but i'd love to sit down and try it out and see what the mechanics are like given that it is it is an interesting way of presenting a new game um uh, another one i am really hyped to try out and i have no idea if i'll ever be able to is tainted grail which okay. For a long time, people were calling the next Gloomhaven killer. It, it did ridiculously good on Kickstarter, and everyone at the time was like, we're going to do it. We're done. We're, this killed. This is going to kill Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven's not going to be the number one game anymore. Tainted Grail's going to beat it as a better legacy game. And it's an Arthurian with fantasy elements, over-the-top, supposedly much tighter story, miniatures, adventure game. And it looked fantastic. But it was. it's from a company that has done some previous kickstarter work and they all do legacy games every game they put out is a legacy game and i gotta admit it looked really good but you know what it's out there people have it and i haven't heard much now this could just be because i am behind on podcasts i'm not totally caught up but like i just heard the secret cabal review it and the secret cabal loved it so it sounds like it promised everything they said this is the most closest to a fantasy role-playing game that they felt in board game form oh excuse me sorry about that so this is like the closest D&D &D board game, right? So it gives you that feel of playing an actual, having real choices with real consequences in a board game, which I got to admit, Gloomhaven's not very good at. You get a you get a choice when you're walking down the road, and then you get a choice when you're in town sometimes, and you can't play in character. We've tried with the, with our group of four players where we tend to go certain ways with it, but like you have to come to a group consensus. And it's definitely not a role-playing field because there's like so many times where you're like, well, I would just do this, and that's not an option that's on the sheet. So yeah, Tainted Grail is a big one I would love to try, but it's Kickstarter exclusive. Like the odds, are, unless someone in Windsor I know happened to back it, there's probably no chance I'll get to try that. Right. Uh, and uh, Angie Games is mentioning Call to Adventure is one she wants to uh, try at a public play night. Yeah, that's one uh, Justin owns a copy of that. Local gamer Justin, uh, whose last name totally is skipping my head right now. He owns a copy. He was bringing it out for a while. I've seen it at Easy Mode. I've seen it at CG Realm. I, for something about it, just didn't gra gra grip me. Like, like just, oh, you want to play Call to Adventure? I was like, eh. I guess, I don't know. And then I, oh, you know what? I'm going to go teach this instead. It just didn't catch me, but it did look interesting. It looks like, again, it has some RPG, more character building elements. It does look like a neat game. I'd be willing to try it. Yeah, and I mean, it's a, it's an hour long 2.0 wait, looks like. So, you know, it's a nice, good solid yeah, that's little not sort too of bad. 
early in the night game, not not when, when you know still warming up. Yeah, that um, one looked interesting. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Red Rainbow Riot is mentioning that uh, the thing with Gloomhaven is that it has a, such a strong super fan audience for it. Yes. The Frosthaven Kickstarter hovering around 10 million mark emphasizes this, and it's oh, one it of those things. There, it's you know people have commented again about this on Twitter where it's the mo the most famous game people are never going to play. <laughs> <It's>, <That's>, <laughs> it does happen. You know, so many people have a copy of Gloomhaven that I'm willing to bet they may not even have punched, let alone gotten to the table and, and, and played, because yep. it's a daunting task yep. to get that game on the table. Oh, I agree. Just an example, we were playing last night with John Carney. He's got a copy. He hasn't opened it. It's still in shrink. Yep. Yeah, I think a lot of people, and that's why I haven't backed we don't have a question on that, do we, yet? <laughs> I thought that one might pop up. Uh, that's why I haven't backed Frosthaven at this yeah. point, is is there is still, there's so much content in the Gloomhaven box. And we're playing semi-regularly. We were playing semi-regularly. Like, we were doing pretty good. And we've been playing since September 2018. And I don't know, like, maybe it's really going to rush to the end. It's just going to be like, bang, 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 six more scenarios, and suddenly we're done. But it sure doesn't feel like it. Like, looking at the stickers at the top and the number of things we still have to mark off. And, I like, I'm. it feels like we're only about halfway through that game. Now, maybe well, I'm, I'm mistaken. To be fair, you guys have sort of jumped around a little bit. And you, haven't, yes. you haven't been rushing towards the end. No, I mean, you, you not You have not said what is the way to the end. Where there yeah. are groups out there who have just said, boom, we're going through and done. Thank you so much for the Thank subscription, you for the good uh, All right, do we do we have any other hot games we want to play? Um, those well, are the I'm big ones. I'm still interested in checking out the uh, the potions new po new and newer potions game for Harry Potter. That's another one my family would probably. That's the two player, or is that uh, the... no? I got the two player. We have the dueling one. The dueling one is the two player version of Hogwarts Battle. Yep, yep. Uh, but there's also the potions. Uh, I'm trying to remember what that can. And you haven't tried the one that's the the retheme of Thanos Rising either, have you? No, and and that one we kind of, yeah. But well, I wasn't sure about whether or not we we were going to go with it, just because again, it's yeah. just a retheme of. Uh, yeah. And then there's also the new expansion coming out for Hogwarts Battle, the potions, yep. charms and potions expansion. And then just announced today, they announced a solo mode. Yep. Which I printed which if out. You follow me on social media. I dropped the link. Actually, it's, it's on my printer right now. I'm probably going to yep. give that a try tomorrow. Uh, there's a Harry Potter potions challenge game. Okay. Uh, which is very badly rated, but it only has two ratings. So I, Oh uh, yeah, that's, that. you never know. Yeah, I'm not even going to look at that. Uh, way in the future. Uh, this isn't new hotness yet, but the Prospero Hall is putting out a back to the future game. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with that. Cause I've well, been really not impressed. That far everything. in the future anymore. Isn't no. it this year? But who knows with yeah. everything going on. Who knows, anything is on any schedule right now. And another one that I'm actually going to get to try is the Daily Magic Games, who do the Valeria games, is putting out a dice-driven Valeria game. And just yesterday, I got the confirmation that I am going to get to check that out. I'm going to get to check out a preview copy of that. So that's one I'm looking forward to. Yep. Uh, all right, so uh, from Facebook, we've yep. got uh, someone looking easy games for three- to five-year-olds. Three to five year olds. Okay, so first off, we have an episode. I don't remember what it's called. It might be Three's Company and then some or something, but it's on three player games to play with a toddler. And I recommend looking at that list. I'm not going to bring it up here. I'm just going to go off my head. But there are a bunch of great games that we played with our kids that were also engaging for adults. So the first one that always comes to mind whenever we talk about toddler games is a game called Monza from Haba Games. And it's a racing game where you're just racing your cars around the track, and the first one to get around the track once wins. But the way you move your cars is there is different colored pattern squares in different colors on the, on the board. And you roll five D6 that are all those colors on the sides of the D6. And then you have to spend the dice to move on the squares. And what's neat about that game is that you can plan ahead. Like you can look at what colors are coming to go and trying to figure out which colors to use first. And some colors are more common than others. So there's actually some bits of strategy in there it's not just roll and move it's not just roll a six and see who moves six you move six and you only move four so the person who rolled six is winning it's really good for teaching colors for teaching pattern recognitions and that deductive reasoning of well what's better if you use the green first and then the red then the blue or if you use the green first then the yellow then the red then the blue you'll get further so not great 
for adults, not a ton of fun, but at least there's something there. Like it, it's, it's it got a little more meat than, you know, stakes and ladders, for example, for, for just a race game where you're rolling the die and moving. There is some deduction, but as far as teaching skills to kids, I think it's fantastic. So that's, that's probably my number one recommendation. Another one my kids loved is um, that is fantastic for adults is Animal Upon Animal and all the variations on it where you have a wooden alligator or crocodile. I don't know which it's supposed to be, and I don't know how to tell the difference. Sorry, I'm not from down south. And you roll a die, and it tells you how many meeple you have to try to put on top. And you take one of your meeple, and you try to stack it on the alligator. And if you get rid of all your animals, you win. If it falls over, you have to take the ones that fell. It's actually the same basic game as hamster roll without the big wheel, It's which I talk about all the time. But the thing with this one is they're nice chunky pieces. And it has the added bonus that a three to five year old is going to play with this game when you're not even there. People are going to just love this game and play with the little wooden animals. So it's, it's a cool game as a game, but it's also a cool toy. It's a cool experience. Along with that was a game called Zimbos or Zimbubos. I forget exactly how it's spelled, but it's like Zimbos. And it's these big chunky wooden blocks that again, you're stacking, trying to get patterns of animals and clowns that again is very much a toy as well, where the kids are going to want to play with just the pieces or play the game. And that's uh, uh, Zimbo, uh, Zimbos, Z-I-M-B-B-O-S, apostrophe, uh, exclamation mark. There you go. See, I knew there was like two Bs. So Zimbobos or Zimbos. Zimbos. I wasn't sure exactly how to do it. Uh, Froggy Boggy was another one my kids enjoyed, which was a memory matched with color matching. So there was a little bit more to it. So you had to remember which which colors of the frogs had little baby frogs underneath them. But there's also a thing where you're rolling two colors. So the frogs are all like divided in half. They're like little frog heads and you pull their eyes out, which I guess is kind of creepy. And then some of them will have little frogs underneath. And what it is is you'll roll the two dice. So you have to find you have to find the frog that has those two colors. And then you're going to pick one of its two eyes to pull. And one of the eyes is going to let you move. The other isn't. So it's that color matching combined with memory. So, again, not great for adults, but you know what? A little more engaging than just, you know, try to flip over two of the same thing with a bunch of cards in front of you. It's that little step above. Um, Goblet Jr. is a really good one that only plays two players, but is basically uh, an, a better version of tic-tac-toe, where you have three sizes of pieces, and the bigger ones can gobble, go on top of the other. So you're just trying to get three in a row, but like if you put down your smallest piece, your opponent can then put a bigger piece over top of it and kind of capture that square. Um, what you know, else? Owl Hoot is another one we've mentioned a few times. Yeah, that's one I haven't played. That um, long time fan of the show, Brian Kurtz, is the one that anytime I talk about kids' games, he brings that one up. I haven't actually tried who would I'll hurt who by the time Brian told us about it, my kids were past the toddler age right. and into kids of Carcassonne and Catan Jr. And, and then uh, La- Magic Laundry Labyrinth. Jumble is the one we always recommend that you can't really yes. find anymore. Yeah, Laundry uh, Jumble. You can find one. a copy of Laundry Jumble. So that was all coming from episode 59. Freeze Company Kids Edition, which we published about seven months ago. Yeah, it's an older one. But yeah, see, uh, my, my suggestions haven't changed because, well, I haven't bought anything new in that age <laughs> period. That, those are the games my kids loved. Uh, there was, um, what was another one? The the Ladybug's Costume Party, or Maskenball de Koffer, which is the German name for it, that uses magnets. And it was really neat because you the, the little ladybugs had little wooden pegs in the back and it was supposed to represent different colored spots on the back of the ladybugs. And what you would do is you would bring two ladybugs together and if they liked each other, they would kiss. And what it was, there were little magnets in them and they would pivot and they would turn to face each other if they liked each other. And that meant you could swap a color, but if they didn't like each other, they would turn away from each other. So you had to figure out which ladybugs wanted to dance with other ladybugs to try to get a full set of ladybugs with all the same spots. Right. And that was actually, a, it works out, it's a deduction game. It's because eventually you're like, well, the green one doesn't like the yellow one, but the yellow one likes the blue one. So to get this from the green to the yellow, I need to go in this order. And it was really good until my kids solved it. Like eventually they figured right. out that logic puzzle and it was just a matter of, yep, yeah, they don't like each other. We swap, these like each other, we like it and i'm like all right we had to get rid of that one because once once and, they solve the game but also uh magnets and little pegs maybe not for three to five yeah toddler depending yeah, on your I, I depending think it was age four plus so right I, they were they were they were like taller like i think they were choke proof tags right uh so uh derek jones over on facebook has asked games that are easy to play over discord or similar but aren't as complex as D D, not just That's rpgs good but things that you could play with family that doesn't have detailed rule sets. 
All right, this is a topic I think that's going to might take a full episode at some point cuz there are so many games you can play online. But some immediate the, the immediate game that came to mind, I don't know why I'm, I've been obsessed with this game since playing at Queen City Conquest last year is For the Queen. If you want that role-playing story experience and you go on Discord, someone just has to have the game, which you can get in PDF cheap. Uh, if you use Roll20, which is actually a different way to play games instead of Discord, Roll20, you can get the set of cards for under 10 bucks, which is cheaper than buying the game. And you can play it through Roll20. But if you're stuck on Discord for whatever reason, all someone someone has to have the game. And that could be a matter of just probably buying the PDF, right, to get all the cards. And what this is is a card-driven RPG story experience. It's a pass-the-stick storytelling where you start off and you literally read card one. And if you were playing the real game, you would then pass the deck and that person would read card two and the next person would read card three, card four, card five, and keep passing it. Well, to play over Discord, just one person would do all the reading and they would sit and they would read the cards off. And what it is, is you get asked leading questions and it's all about the fact that you're a retinue traveling with a queen to a distant empire. And I can't remember what the setup is you're vying for peace or you're vying for war. Like there's obviously, there's a little bit more to the setup. I don't remember off the top of my head. And you're asked questions like, um, what did you do in the past that made the queen angry? And then you answer and you start off like you don't have a character. There's no character sheet. You're just going to answer that question. Just come off with it off the top of your head and be like, oh, um, I made the queen angry because she caught me trying to steal some food from the kitchen. So now I already have this idea in my head that, oh, my character is someone who would steal. Why would I steal? Am I stealing because I'm poor? And so on. And you just keep going around the table, asking leading questions until you get to this one card in the game that comes to a climax of the game. And I don't want to spoil that in case anyone hasn't played it before. But you get to this one card, you ask a final question, everyone answers that, and you're done. Like, if you want that pure role-playing experience that literally requires nothing but one deck of cards, this one set of questions, you could play that over Skype, Discord, anything. Uh, we also have, again, a full episode of games that don't require contact. Almost all of those would work over Discord with one camera. So you need, so any board game where you don't have your own personal stuff, where, or all you have is your own personal stuff. It goes either way. But the main one I'm thinking for Discord is if everything's on the board. You just need someone with a camera to point it at the board and do all the moves for everyone. Now, I have seen, and I think it would drive me insane, a lot of groups that are using Discord to play Gloomhaven right now. And people have done some really neat stuff where they've taken scraps of paper to put out a coordinate grid along the edge of the hexes. So it just says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the people on Discord can be like C5 to D8. And then the person who's controlling it just moves the miniature. And they're like, is that where you want to move? Yep, yeah, okay. Um, but then it's all one player doing all the work, right? So you have to know all your cards, but you know what you can honestly, and I don't know how legal this is. You can find all the decks online in PDF format. So I, I'm pretty sure Isaac's probably pretty good with you downloading your character deck from wherever to at least be able to see your cards. And then it's just a matter of you having to keep track of what you have and what you don't have, like what's been played, right? The best way I think to do it would be as if there's some way to take your Gloomhaven and split it up. Like, take your player components home, I take my player components home, Sean takes his player components home, and then I set up the map, and you just play your own cards. But any game with a central board, like we talked about Robo Rally for that, but again, that's, everyone has to have their own decks. I mean, I would, I would definitely lean into, uh, if, we're, if, we, if we're on the RPG side, uh, pretty much anything Fate or Powered by the Apocalypse. As long as you've mm. got one person who knows the system, you can pretty much get through it. Uh, it, it the, the games are so easy to teach and so story based, and 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 you know, but just a couple of six sided dice, um, you know, at most you can generally get through it uh, yeah. quite easily. Because again, it's the it's the game master who needs to know the structure and the, the function. Yeah, for actually, powered by the apocalypse, with as long as, like to be honest, you're not supposed to call out the moves. Yeah. So if you didn't know what your moves were on your play sheet, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's Power by the Apocalypse is great for pre-gens. There's so many pre-gens yeah. out there. You don't even have to worry about character building if you don't want to, even though really that is a lot of the fun of, well, yeah, of building they your character those Power by the Apocalypse. But, you know, you can try it out once and see if people like it and then, yep. you know, go back and do the character build again a second time. Now, Fate is iffy just because 
you want to have those aspects. So again, if one person can have a camera, if you've got some way to show the aspects or the sheet. So again, here's where Discord kind of falls down. But you could use a Discord chat. So if you have video with the chat, you can have them all listed. But anything like Fantasy Grounds or Roll20, where you can have basically index cards on the screen so everyone can see it. Or even more so, just open a shared Google Doc. Right. So with Discord, you open up your shared Google Doc and you have on the on the side, you have your Excel or Sheets or Google Sheets uh, open that says, you know, world aspects, um, triggers and all the, all the various different things that are in play for fake games, I think work well. And even to be honest, I think D&D &D works fine as long as you're not looking at doing maps and miniatures like I, I ha would have no problem playing D&D &D 5th edition on Discord. I would not want to play D&D &D 4th edition on Discord just because of the focus of the rule sets or even Pathfinder because Pathfinder is very much about uh, positioning and grid movement moving so many squares. But for lighter RPGs, like you can even look up, there's games like Hero Kids, um, Mermaid Adventures from Aloy Lasanta, which just uses D6s. Everyone's going to have D6s, right? All you need is some black and white D6s. And you tell stories about mermaids. Like you're looking for family-friendly games. There is no map there's no miniatures there's none of that required everyone just needs their own character sheet and they're available as pdfs online so you just download each character sheet you go through character generation character generations is rolling a bunch of charts so the person with the book would sit there and everyone else in the camera would be like okay roll a d8 all right you have purple hair okay roll a d6 okay you have one sibling and so on uh, and, and there are uh, danielle in the chat is mentioning and i think we talked about this on our previous a previous time i just don't know if it was uh in, during the podcast or not but the Descended by the Queen, uh, inspired yeah. by For the Queen uh, decks that are out there. There's quite a quite a bunch of them. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people who have hacked For the Queen yeah. en enough that it's now almost a genre of game. There's there's all kinds, right? Like, it, it depends Fiasco, what you like. Fiasco too. is another one made, uh, Danielle mentioned in the, uh, in the chat room, which is another one. This is uh, I've started described as living a Coen Brothers movie in under three hours. Yes. Yes, I own a copy of Fiasco. And I'm a, Fiasco, it, even more so than For the Queen, requires a lot of improv skills and imagination. Like, at least For the Queen kind of gives you a setting, whereas Fiasco, like, you're like, all right, you're all at a dance club. And it's like, I don't, to me, it's just a little too yeah, freeform. It, it's a, it's a, probably a bit rough for fa for our family gamers to, to play. Well, that too. Real yeah. gamers, you could probably, uh, you know, if, if, if they were of the right type. Yep. But uh, family play, maybe not. But yeah, I'm almost saying they feet powered by the apocalypse. A lot of the indie games, just go over to itch.io and you will find a million free games that you can try out. Uh, one plays RPGs. Um, Rocker Boys and Vending Machines from my our friend Phil Vecchion. It's one of my favorite games to play and run now. It's a it's two sided sheet and you play Cyberpunk. If you know Cyberpunk tropes, you can play this game. If you've ever played Shadowrun, you've ever played Cyberpunk, you've ever read William Gibson, or you watch Neuromancer or not watching Roman, or Johnny Mnemonic, you could play this game. It's that simple. Uh, Love and Justice is like the, the Sailor Moon, the Magical Girl version. There's Lasers and Feelings, which is the original game, which lets you play Star Trek, though it's, sorry, Star Trek. <laughs> there, there's, I think there, there's a, something of Force and Darkness or something is the Star Wars hack. Like, there's tons of them. Uh, Lady Blackbird is another one that comes strongly recommended without any um, needing to set up, again, short. Everyone's given a role, really simple D6 system. Um... Uh, Cosmic Patrol is one I have downstairs, which lets you play, um, what do you call that? I don't even know the time period. The Flash Gordon, the the Rocket Punk, the, the sci-fi Buck Rogers Flash Gordon era of, of over the top. We had a lot of fun playing that system, and all it uses is funky dice. But like all the really dead simple systems were probably what you want, and you probably want to just find family-friendly adventures for them. Like Lasers and Feelings, I'm pretty sure you can do Star Trek at all age periods, because I've been into Star Trek since I was a little kid. Now, one thing I'm interesting, and I think uh, RP drive through RPG is definitely missing out on, uh, if I look at their browse categories, I don't see any like they they need to have a category that sort of that people can put their games into that are like you know either dice free or you know limited <laughs> tools they almost need a, a separate category for yeah. this time of age that where you can you know physically distance and play this rpg is uh because there's no good way to sort that 
Yeah, not not on drive through RPG. To be honest, I'd like that sounds silly because you're asking us. We're supposed to be the experts, but I almost want to say just Google it, right? <laughs> like, there's so many RPG. Like, that's just such a broad question, right? Like, I'm assuming with D and D you want fantasy. That's why I was leaning toward Mermaid Adventures. There's uh, Dungeon World would be the Powered by Apocalypse version of D and D, which would become strongly recommended. Dungeon World would be the one that is the most Dungeon Dragons like old school Dungeon Dragons. Go into a dungeon, kill some monsters, get some loot. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, Ryan asks, "How are you doing with making a dent in the pile of unplayed games?" <laughs> well, it's not going as well as I had hoped by this point in time in the year. I had hoped to, especially the pile of obligation I had planned to be done before uh, going to Origins for sure, um, and well, hopefully it was going to be done before Breakout. But with the worldwide pandemic, uh, I can only really play two-player games right now, so that is making things a little difficult. Um, there are probably a couple games that I could involve the kids in and play, but those aren't the ones I have to review very much. So it has not been going good. Um, what has happened is I have played a game, a couple games off my personal uh, pile of shame, stuff that sat around. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple later in the show, actually. Two games we got off the pile of shame on the weekend. Uh, not a too much else, actually. Um there's goals. There, the, we have a pile of two-player games. The problem is convincing Deanna to play something new. She always wants to sit down and play something she already knows, which <laughs> is fair. So we have to compromise and play something she wants to play, and then I have to convince her to play something new now and then. Like, I really want to get Lord of the... Lord, it's not Lord of the Ring. War of the Ring to the table. That's a big two-player one. I still want to play Julius Caesar. That's another one that just we've had forever. Um, I've got Vikings 677. I think that's a, whatever. It's Vikings. It's from uh, the same people that did the War of 1812 game. Sorry, Invasion of Canada. 18, 1812 Invasion of Canada. It's from the same people who did that. It's a Viking game. I've been itching to play that because we've been watching the Vikings TV show. So we've got that one we want to play. Like So uh, we're getting some. Like I said, there was two. Two came off my personal pile of shame this weekend. So it is happening. It's the pile of obligation that's hurting for this. And I, I have to assume, I haven't asked permission, but I have to assume publishers are okay with this. There's not much I can do about that. Uh, what I have been doing in the meantime, though, is finding games that are two-player that I can work with. So we did review. We're going to review a game today from Renegade Games, and we reviewed a game last week from Renegade Games because there happens to be a representative from Renegade Games that lives in Windsor, Ontario. And uh, no, we we are, we haven't even met. We're just doing porch drops. So I get a I get a heads up. It's like, all right, this game's out on my porch, and I drive out to East Windsor and I swap the games I have for the games on their porch. So you know what? We're, we're doing what we can. Um, it's nice to be able to work with Renegade Games. So at least I'm getting some stuff done. But yeah, there's definitely a pile of stuff that that hasn't been touched. It is shrinking. Like I, I I'm not going to bring it up, but I could bring up the list. It is slowly getting smaller. Out of what's left, though, it's going to be rough. The the well, the one I keep thinking we could probably do and give it a fair shake is I have one more expansion for Eminent Domain. Like, I'm sure everyone remembers about six months back, like, it was Eminent Domain, Eminent Domain, Eminent Domain. That was all we were talking about. We kind of got burnt out on it. So I was like, all right, you know what? We're going to put this away for a while. But I am pretty sure with Deanna and I just playing with Exotica, which is the expansion we haven't reviewed, I'd still be able to give it a fair shake and realize how it would play with more players. Because it's just at that point, I'm adding some more text and some more. It adds a new tech, it adds a new resource, and it adds in some aliens. Like so, I, I think I'd be able to judge how it would play with more players. So that's one. But like, I've got a dexterity game. Deanna hates dexterity games. I'm not going to review that with her. Or I've got that four-player um, Lost Cities game, which we know is terrible two players. So I'm not going to review that. I don't know. It's been a little rough. Yep. Because uh, is War is War of the Rings. Uh, sorry, War of the Ring, uh, yeah. a obligation or just... No, it's yeah. just something I own. Something I've owned for a long time. It was on the bottom of a pile of shame. Get Conan to the table? Yeah, see, that's another one. That's, that's again, I, that, I just moving everything out of the way. <laughs> uh, the one I'm thinking of doing, Pathfinder, the adventure card game. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's best at two-player only. Um, I just don't know if I if feel, I guess I'd review it as a two-player only experience. Like, I'd have to. We are talking about trying that one out, though. We're both intimidated to jump into that, which is a bad sign. Like, we play some pretty heavy games, and we're intimidated by it. Like, that's what we'll see once we play. Like, that's part of the review right there, the fact that I have a card game that both Deanna and I are intimidated to play because the rule book is just so dense and thick. Well, and not only the rule book, but, you know, again, today, just today, I was editing 
our unboxing for the first expansion for yeah. the Pathfinder Core Gameplay. And the fact that you are talking about the sheer weight, the mass of the expansion that has mm -hmm. these five giant decks of cards. Oh. And that's just an expansion. And <laughs> how much info is on each card? Yeah. Like they're I, not just, it says plus two, right? It's yeah. not like a Star Realms card. It's, it's, it's dense in many different ways. <laughs> Um, and so it's it's not really surprising that it's a little uh, little uh, intimidating to get to the table. All right. Supposedly Jeff has some comments that he left on the Discord because he could not get into that. I can't open up right now for risk of. Oh, true. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You opening Discord will be bad. We don't usually keep that open. Anything else by anyone in the chat right now while this is loading up? Because this shouldn't kill anything on my end. You no, know, no, no one really. Uh, Come on, it's an AMA. We've people. talked about uh, you know some of the stuff you've already talked about. We the descended by the queen stuff. Um, Edgekill is mentioning uh, there's a rolling app, Roll for Your Dot Party, that allows uh, sure. dice allows everyone to see the dice rolled using a whiteboard in Zoom, and that app to play some games. Uh, so Ryan has asked, are there games on your shelf? You were totally hyped to get and totally intended to play, but haven't since you got to them, or are any of them still in shrink? Oh, yeah, yeah. That that definitely happens still. Uh, Descent 2nd Edition, Descent Journeys in the Dark 2nd Edition, War of the Ring. War of the Ring, like, that's, like, super, it was hard to get out of print. I got a copy of War of the Ring. That one is one. Uh, one sitting behind me right here, Eclipse. That's just because I need to unbox it, but and, and then it's going to sit because I'm not going to play it a long time. I have an expansion for Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition that I never actually got to the table that I paid way too much for. Uh, Battlestar Galactica expansions I seem bad for. Expansions are like box inserts. I get the expansion for the game, then I never play it uh, ever again because I don't know if we've moved on to other things. Um, there, yes, it happens. I, I get super excited. I'm like, oh, I gotta have that game, and I buy it. Now, I will admit, since starting the bellhop, that happens a lot less often because I brought back a bunch of stuff from Origins. I was excited to play. Once I had that pile, along with the pile of shame we are already talking about working through, now if I buy a game, I'm super excited about it, and they tend to get played within a week. Like, uh, Coimbra is one that we I finally got to the table. But it didn't sit that long. Like, I've only had it since Christmas, which really isn't, yes, okay, it's four months. But it's not a super extensive period of time. But, like, Clans of Caledonia, we've already reviewed. So, I like, if I look at my Excel file that shows my pile of obligation, my reviews, and the stuff I bought, everything I bought in 2019 I've already played. So, I played every game I bought last year, which is pretty impressive for me. Not every game I had in the pile of obligation, but everything I bought, we played. We, we played multiple times on some of them, which never happened before because now I'm just being a lot more selective in what I'm willing to buy. And when I buy it, I'm excited. I'm like, oh, I want to play this game. We're going to play this night, and I bring it home, and I would do the unboxing video, and then I sit and prep it and everything else. So, But, yeah, the, um, CO2. I backed the Kickstarter for CO2 Second Chance from Vital Lacerda. I love the original game. I finally did the unboxing video. That's live, but I don't know when I'm going to get that played. Um, they're there. Uh, th to be honest, that Pathfinder Adventure card game is one of them. I was really curious to try out that system. We have friends that play it. They now they played the original printing. There's a new 2019 edition, which is what I have. But yeah, there are definitely games that I'm like, gotta have it, and then it sits there, and sometimes still in shrink. Uh, Conan, um, Rune Wars. Rune Wars is a, I think it's called Rune Wars. It's a miniature game. And it was considered the the follow like the, the closest follow up to rank and file Warhammer Fantasy Battle, but still playing quickly. So it wasn't skirmish, it wasn't miniatures all over and small war bands. It was rank and file on bases, maneuvering and stuff like that, which is what I grew up playing, which Sean and I grew up playing. And I have a nostalgia feeling for that, but I don't want to play a game that takes all weekend, which is what the problem with the original was. And I heard Room Wars was really good. And there are some local gamers that swear it is the best miniature game ever made. But it's no longer supported. They killed it. And the local gamers are the type that once a game's dead, they stop playing. Like, which gets frustrating but i get it somewhat they're like oh fancy flight doesn't support it i can't play it anymore and, I, and sometimes i'm like what the game police aren't going to show up and kill you for <laughs> not playing a game but i get it like you you lose that you know that you're never going to get anything new you know you're never going to get new units you're stuck with what you got maybe you go out and complete your collection or not 
So I have literally a sealed, shrink-wrapped copy of Room Wars downstairs because I just never got around to it. I, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to play that, and I'm going to bring it out because the people play at Soul and Shop on Sundays, and there's a local community to play this game. This will be great. And I've even heard it's fantastic. But no, it's sitting there. It's it's in shrink wrap. It's downstairs. I considered se sh selling it, but like the price on Amazon right now, it's a hundred dollar MSRP. It's probably about thirty five bucks on Amazon right now. So at this point, there's like no reason to even sell it because it's just not. A, I don't know. We'll put it in an extra life auction or something at this point. All right. Well, Tex got a question for us. What is the next upgrade you would like to get for the tabletop bellhop setup? I think Sean's got that next to him, actually. So it's right there. It just has to come down to Windsor. It is. We have we have light. We have a new light for for uh, the bellhop. Yes. Uh, but technically, we already have that. You just don't have it. So yes, we we have it. It's just not down here. I think we need two. I don't think one's going to be enough. That's one, part of well, the problem. One, one goes a long way. One is good. Yeah. One is going to make a big difference. Two would be ideal. Uh, yeah. I actually run two, and then I've got a little a little face light in there for my for my catch light on my eyes. Um, and, and I would actually, you know, honestly, if, if I would keep this and use it as the third for a backlight too, because <laughs> three point lighting, but, uh, but I'm a geek. Um, yeah. a lot of people deal with just one light, so it's not the end of the world. Um, so I don't know. I, I, like two lights was, was the goal. So a light is probably the next big upgrade. Um, I, I want to get two cameras going somehow. I just, I don't even know how. I don't know if that involves like using an actual camera or getting another webcam. Part of it problem is Deanna's laptop. I really don't know if it's going to handle another camera, another input or not. Um, I would like to get two cameras for our live plays and for unboxings. I want to be able to do the, the green screen thing where we have a face down and we can put cards under the camera or miniatures or whatever we're trying to show off. Like, oh, I got this card. Oh, I'm playing this. Yep. Like even our Gloomhaven game, right? So anyone who's watched our live streams, we've now taken to taking the two cards we're playing and putting them on the table in front of the camera, which I don't think anyone can read the text on them, but you might get an idea what the card is, especially if you play the class, you're probably going to be like, oh, I know those two cards. And we say the name of the card, but I would even more so love to throw them under a green screen and have them show up nice and big and readable for yep. the people who don't necessarily know the cards. Yep. And and like that in, in other games, right? Even, even when we were playing... Earlier today, I could show off the cards a lot better. I could be like, look, here's the six suits we are using to play today, and this is this card, this is this card. And then when we're actually playing, you'd be able to better tell from a distance what's actually out there on the board because you have seen it up close. Yeah. So that's something. So that involves some type of new camera, a new mount, and, well, a piece of construction paper, which I'm sure I could figure that one out. And then getting it to work on Dion's laptop, which also requires a USB port, which probably has to be powered. And D doesn't even have 3.0 USB. So, like, I don't know. Yeah. So another possible upgrade is a PC for downstairs. And we've been strongly considering that. Uh, basically putting it under the table. The The legs of my game table are, what do you call that, concave? Yep. So you could basically nest. Like, it would be out of the way. It'd be very, it wouldn't be, no one's going to kick it. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least not that often, right? Like, <laughs> it, it should be mostly out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, for streaming-wise, realistically, uh, we can probably find something refurb uh, to go down there uh, yeah. and, and get something decent. It's not like we need a super gaming computer. No, you exactly. Just need, you just need something with the ports more than anything. Well, yeah, we, we, need, um, a, we need a modern, yeah. more modern system that has USB 3.0. And, and what, one of the steps we actually took today, so here you go, this is what we did today, is I, the cable... For uh, not that anyone can see where I'm really pointing, now runs up my door and out my door and around the um, closet door and over my mom's door, over that, behind our spice rack and down the stairs. And that's how far we got. We got to figure out how is we're going to wire it downstairs. What, what people aren't aware of is that every Friday night before Gloomhaven, there was a cable running party where we would yes. where, where where cable would get reeled out from the office down yeah. into the gaming area in order to make that Gloomhaven stream happen you know, yes semi because wi-fi was not working no. so the another piece we want to add to that is i want to get a, a port down there switcher because the other problem i'm having is disney plus in canada does not like my wi-fi netflix runs fine uh amazon prime runs fine but disney plus is unwatchable so i don't well, know luckily luckily that i can give you as well when the light goes down well, we'll bring yeah. a switch down and, and make sure you've got a switch yep. And then uh, I just have I've to got buy a dozen of them or so sitting around. Yeah. 
So I just need a switch, and we got to mount that somehow. Yep. But yeah, oh, I don't yeah. know. The, the lighting, I think, is going to make the biggest difference, and then then it's going to be the tech for more cameras. I just don't know. Like, I don't know what order any of that stuff happens in. Yeah, I mean, well, like, realistically, for you guys, I, I know what I would love to get. The problem is funding. Um, yeah. Again, that's the big thing. Uh, the Blackmagic Mini Mixer uh, has a mini mini video mixer, uh, which can handle up to four different cameras uh input but then it outputs into your la into your even your laptop as a usb camera so with four it's, inputs though yeah, yeah with four inputs and then huh. you can mix picture in picture and, and do stuff like that wow so it's i mean it's a video mixer but it's designed yeah. for youtubers so it's it's a very small compact little yeah. little device but it's you know it's a few hundred bucks 100 bucks so it's the sort of the difference between that or a or a computer at this point yeah, there's a, there, I have a local source for computers, and I think that's what I need to do is get a hold of my local source and just say, what can you do? Yeah. Right? Like, here's what I want to do. Really basic. What can you You got something in the back room, basically. But uh, I'm just popping a, a link in the chat room right now. That's the AT, ATEM Mini, which is the, the video mixer for YouTubers and uh, like us who don't need, you know, a studio mixer. But right need to be able to uh you know have more than one input and, and do some switching back and, and if forth. that's small that might be something useful for the future plans because I, I was talking to sean about this the other day i wouldn't mind portable setups for us to bring to cons specifically origins because origins gives you media room time where you can book one hour slots to actually do interviews and stuff yeah. and i think that would be cool to do like that's more of a, a dream kind of thing to do but to do that we would need portable equipment to yeah. be able to do it and i actually have a rolling audio rack and things that i can do but video is a different story, and that's yeah. that would be something for for that sort of uh, setup. All right, jumping back a bit to the RPG. Uh, now that I got Discord up, and Jeff can take part. So we noted there is a Roll Twenty module uh, that lets you play it online for For the Queen. I think I mentioned that it's like under ten bucks. Uh, there is also the Quiet Year, which is a simple map drawing RPG. Uh, Matt uh, Dave is involved. Said the Quiet Year is interesting. Uh, people have used that to start their D and D campaign, which I think is more like um, microscope type of thing, where you're world building ahead of time. And then follow by Ben Robbins is the simplest story game to teach, and is very epic quest focused, like D and D, but plays more past the stick. So take out follow by Ben Robbins, and thank you, Jeff, for the suggestion because that's, that's not something. one I know. That definitely sounds like something, uh, if you're looking for something simpler than D&D, yeah. but you want that fantasy epic feel, that definitely sounds like a solid option. What was one that we had? This goes back a few, like quite a few episodes. Remember the Adventures of Varen von Munchausen? Yeah. That one sounded fantastic, where you have like a which way book of story prompts, and you would tell a story, and then Sean would have to, like the next player would have to one-up you, and then the next player would have to one-up them, and you could spend some kind of resource to question them and go, no, no, you're you're lying, you're, you're full of yep you're, you're full of bs which that one sounded really cool yeah no, oh there absolutely. you go that so microscope kingdom and follow are all ben robbins so microscope right. i know kingdom i know of uh lady blackbird from back in 2009 yep. is another one that's uh, yeah i mentioned that one the the d6 base one page rpg all right what else do we have do we have anything else rune wars is weird unnecessary confusion Prior to the minis games, there was a Room Wars, the board game. Yes, I have the board game. The board game is actually really interesting. Uh, <clears throat> Room Wars is actually a really good 4X epic fantasy game where you're almost playing two games at once, where you're controlling your kingdom and moving stuff around, but you're also playing heroes that are running around doing things. I actually really like the Room Wars board game. As for the miniature game, I don't know. People I know love it, so I don't know... I, I'm hoping, I think Ryan's saying it's unnecessary confusion due to the fact that there are multiple games with the same name. All right. Uh, well, that's about all we've got in the chat. Anyone else have any other questions? Here, finish, uh, finish this sentence. Brandon Picker writes, <laughs> yeah, I want to play games, but I'm not desperate enough to play... <laughs> Candyland. I got to use that. That's the one there we always go. use on this that's show. That's the one. There's got to be better ones, though. No, uh, well, I would Monopoly, play Candyland. Um, um, I Candyland. actually would play Monopoly, just because, I, to be honest, I never tried Monopoly with the real rules. I never have. I grew up with uh, too many houses in the box because it's someone cobbled together version with too many houses, and the 
bank had infinite money and sometimes we did the the free parking sometimes we didn't we never did the auction so i i like monopoly sounds like it should be an answer there but no that's not there um i would not play cards against humanity i have no interest in that whatsoever or many of the other variants of adult gross we're gonna make you say inappropriate things games um there are there are groups i will play those with um some i won't you know yeah that but i don't know i'll play other games that are adult games math, math that, guy that dave says I... clue i will play clue i will not play harry potter clue you know, there you go me. yep uh, no i i play clue clues all right i yeah. me and diana have played clue clues a decent enough game i it's okay um I, I, there's not a lot that i wouldn't ever play I'm sure they're out there. Like, like I said, the most of them are the, the, the adult silly games, uh, the X-rated games, the, the 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 Swingers Monopoly that came up. Oh, that wasn't on this show. That was on. So <laughs> it that was that was on when I was talking to Chris uh, Chris Marinted the other day while we were chatting. Someone in the chat room said they picked up a Monopoly game, and oh, I wish I could remember the name of it. And it, it was drink your drinking Monopoly, drinking Monopoly, which they thought was going to be like do a shot when you land on these spots. Well, it was also Swingers Monopoly, and that did not go over well at the game night. They broke it out at because they broke it out without having read the rules before playing. So right. I wouldn't play that. I have no interest in playing any of those <laughs> adult games. I know some people are into that, but not not for me. Uh, Mario Monopoly. Yeah, yeah we tell. I think we we talked about Mario. Game I, I would That's try. A good one. I would try Monopoly Gamer. I hear Monopoly Gamer is really good. I ended up that ended up going down my top five Monopoly games. Yeah, uh, and there, there's an, another one too. There's the, the what is it? Mario Kart. Yeah. There's Sonic. There's Overwatch. All of those are versions of Monopoly Gamer. I try Overwatch would be nothing to me though. Like I know none of nothing about Overwatch. Uh, so Drinkopoly might have been the game. Drinkopoly, yeah, that Drinkopoly, sounds right. Drinkopoly, the blurriest game ever. Yeah, that uh, sounds right. Sounds. Uh, it it doesn't come out. It doesn't say it's a swingers game, but it definitely talks about like kissing challenges and yeah stuff well, like that. Yeah, like, no thanks. More of a more of a college dorm party than mm. than a family game. <laughs> so I don't think they broke it out at a family game night, but I think it was one of, like had the neighbors over yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, it was pretty amusing. Let's say I totally forgot it wasn't on this show because of that. <laughs> uh, well, heck, at uh, Extra Life last year, we gave away or didn't give away. We auctioned off several adult games. They were some of our most popular yep. games. Yeah, to be year. honest, people they, people we're, do we're, like them. Do. You know what? And they're you know what? They're great. They can be great as a couple's game. Yes. As groups, they can get awkward. But yeah. if you want to play adult games as an adult couple, go right ahead. Heck, More if you want to do it as groups, go ahead. As long That's as it. everyone's as long as That's everyone's it. signed as long up. As everyone buys into it. Yep. And you're not surprising Jim and Bob or yes. Stephen Terry or even from worse across one the street. of a couple. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you got both both parties buy in if you're gonna play any of those games. I remember years ago, Deanna and I got something. I don't even remember what it was called, and we tried to play once, and we're like, "This is just dumb. Like, this is just <laughs> terrible. This is just barely a game." A game. Come on. All right, let's homebrew it. <laughs> yeah, we we could have. It was it was bad. I think we probably still have it upstairs. Uh... And something positions or something it was called. And I was yeah. just like, this isn't even like, it, it wasn't even like kinky and fun. It was just right. dumb. Like it yep. was we're like, all right, let's just put this away. Not, not, not my kind of games, but like I said, all the power to you. I, whatever works. Uh, all right. We sell, what is it? Triple Xopoly. We have sold a few copies of, which I have to assume is from our date night post. Cause there's a link there. So, yeah. <laughs> Sounds better. It, it, it's it's the if you sign up for the drinking game monopoly and it becomes the swinger game monopoly. There you go. That's not the right thing. Right. So we got a question from Christopher John who asks, "What's everyone's favorite dexterity game?" You know, it's hard to pick a favorite, right? So I like dexterity games in general, but my God, there's some great ones. Like, oh man, I apologize. I ate Mexican tonight. I should not eat Mexican before a podcast. I think I we've covered that before on this show. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not the one to plan dinner. Um, so so I, there's like a, a top list. Like, like Go Cuckoo is so amazing. Like I, I don't see how that can't be my favorite. Like Go Cuckoo is just so accessible. Both my kids can play it. You could possibly even play that with a toddler. Like like it it is so dead simple, easy yeah. to teach, and 
amazing how good and bad different people are at it. Like, yep. like I played with a nurse that was just like, <laughs> and that's how quick they would pull sticks and nothing would fall. And yeah. I'm just like, oh, and then I got other people that would balance stuff on the very edges and sticking out and make this giant net. Oh, that game's amazing. Yep. Like, but then how do I compare that to pitch car? Like pitch car is just so much fun. Every time I play it, everyone who plays it enjoys it. And like, and it's just so what I love about pitch car is I could get Joe off the street to play it. One of my most favorite nights of playing pitch car was at a bar downtown called Villains Bistro, where we were having a gaming night. And the gaming night's supposed to add in at 10, and then a live band's supposed to start. Well, the night I brought out pitch car, because it was racing night, all the games were race or sports, it was sports night. All the games everyone brought were sports teams. It didn't end. We were there till three in the morning playing pitch car. And it was, by the end of the night, it was like me and, um, Oh, a local gamer who I haven't, Yannick, Yannick Allard, who I haven't seen in a long time. Hey, Yannick, if you happen to listen to our podcast. And him and strangers that like just came in and saw what we were doing and started taking part. Like it's like playing darts, right? Like people just see you flicking this thing around. Oh, can I play? Can I do it? And of course there was lots of alcohol going on, which doesn't matter. It's pitch car. Like, yeah, okay. You knock it off the track a bit more. Love pitch car. And then you can add all the extra tracks and the jumps and the, the loop the loops and the figure eights and all the different things you can do with it. So uh, how do I rank that versus go cuckoo? And then there's hamster roll, which is the like the thinking man's dexterity game yep. because it's all about positioning that piece and which piece to play. And yes, there is dexterity involved. You do have to have some skill to put those things on the wheel, but it's it's all about screwing your neighbor basically and making sure they can't play and looking at what pieces they have left. Like all three of those. I love all three of those. But I also and, like junk art. And, well, and then there's also um, sort of games that aren't dexterity games, but are dexterity games like climbers. Yeah. Which, the which I, are, it's okay. not a dexterity game, but it really kind of is at the same time. Yep. Um, which is, you know, which is a great one. But yeah, no, I mean, the Go Cuckoo and, and Hamster Roll especially are so incredibly different yes. and fantastic in their own ways for different groups of people. Oh, that's it. And, or even the same groups of people. Yeah. Like, the same people like both. And there's other, like, like junk art. You take every different stacking game you can possibly imagine for stacking weird shapes and throw it all in one box and randomize what little micro game you play. Like, see, to me, I, that I, and see, I wasn't a huge fan of, of uh, Junk Oh, you didn't like? See, I like Junk I like how one time it's about stacking, the next time it's about getting them next to each other, then the next one's all about how tall you can make it, then the next time it's all about speed. I love that game. But there are so many. But yeah, I, I think the big three are Hamster Roll, Go Cuckoo, and Pitch Car. And I don't know which wins out of both those. Depends who I'm with and what I'm playing. And if I've got eight people, it's going to be Pitch Car because you can't play the other games with eight people. And see, I barely even consider Pitch Car a, a dexterity. Yes, it is. It's absolutely a, oh, definitely. a dexterity yeah. game. But it's weird because I don't. when I think of dexterity games, it never comes to mind. Um, it's it. You know, I, I think of the, the Penguin game before I think of the... Oh, yeah, that's that. another one. Ice yeah. cool. That's a ice great cool. flicky game. Um, all right, so we got a question. Another question from the chat room from Mountain Papa. All right. Games given to you as a gift. Did you say thanks? But you were thinking, no, oh, thank you. Oh, this is you know what the funniest one is, and I've now heard it's a good game, but we never played it. Is we used to sell the N and I used to sell on eBay professionally. There was a small business we owned called Retro Toy Box, and we sold vintage toys. And someone gave us the eBay board game one year because they're like, we know you sell on eBay. And I, I don't remember if it was it was Dee's sister or mom. I don't remember where it came from. And it was this like electronic game with you had to figure out the prices on things. And we're, we never played it. It went up like we were at the apartment in the time and we put it up. And like, I remember where it sat in the top of the closet. This is before I owned as many games. Like, I remember it sitting there forever and like moving and being like, oh, yeah, the eBay game. And eventually we just got rid of it. And what's funny is, I don't know, it's when I started listening to podcasts, someone, Tom Vassell, or like a big podcaster, was going on about how good it is. They were like, oh, man, I guess we should have gave it a try. <laughs> but we just assumed, like, a licensed yeah. game based on eBay, there is no way. That is the one I remember the most. That Like, I remember getting eBay the board game and, and just being like, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, We'll, we'll put that. I was kind of that way, uh, and it wasn't even my gift, it was my kid's gift, but someone got them, the the Doctor Who Yahtzee. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's a really cool looking TARDIS, and they opened it up, and we saw that it was just a plastic interior with no padding or any like Ooh. belt or anything, and I'm like, okay, I don't want this game anymore. <laughs> it's just Yahtzee. And then it turned out that the Yahtzee dice were 
graphically bad enough that you had a hard time figuring out oh, what everything was. And it's like, okay, well, I got these three things, and th- but is that a full house or is that a straight? Is that a small straight? I'm not even sure if that's a small straight. Is that a, I got mm-hmm. these four different dice, but maybe that's not a small straight. I, let, I don't know. So, yeah, I like, give me just some die six for my Yahtzee. Yeah, you know, I, I remember love Doctor Who. <laughs> local, 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 a friend of ours, Two's, got the Dragon Ball Yahtzee. Right. And it was the same thing. I'm like, so how do you know if that's a straight or not? It was like all characters' faces. Yeah. Like, well, if you get one of each different character's face, it's a straight. And I'm like, yeah. I guess, okay, sure. I, I guess. Yeah. I'm trying to think for gifts. I don't, when I get games for gifts, they tend to be off wish list. Because everyone knows I have a large collection, so it's yeah. not often I get random games. So, um, I think at one point I got the Snarf Quest game as a gift from someone, and that was absolutely horrible. That was one of the worst games I ever played. It was my most negative review on the, my old blog, the Windsor Gaming Resource, before I wrote the Master of the Universe review, <laughs> which is the one that tops all of them. And it was so bad. Like, it was just terrible. It came with a miniature, the Snarf miniature from right. snarf quest and but like you literally randomly moved on a track and then you read a passage that was a passage from the comic book and you rolled the die to see if you could take the card or not and if you didn't it was the other player's turn or something like it, it was like as as bare minimum a game as possible from a comic that's licensed off D D. like come on make yeah. an actual game out of it <laughs> yeah i know uh mage kale in the chat room saying uh doc- agrees with doctor who yahtzee and apparently there was a doctor who clue uh, Star Wars Risk, <laughs> um, you know, ways to take good games and make them bad. We, we talked Star about Star Wars some... Risk. The the Star Wars Risk I have is fantastic. Yeah. Star Wars Risk, the Black Series Risk, I really like actually. If it's the same one where you're fighting three battles at once, you got the battle uh, in space, you've got Luke fighting Vader, and then you've got Han on Endor, and you have to use your cards, and each card is going to affect two of those things, but not the third. So you have to decide which two battles you want to progress on tracks on or move your dice. And then there's some dice rolling stuff. I actually really like that game. It's a, it's a re-theme of the Queen's Gambit, which is one of the big rail games that everyone, everyone is trying to get a hold of, which was when episode one came out and you fought the battle of Thede. So you had the, the clone army versus the Gungans. And then you had Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan fighting Darth Maul. And then you had the palace where the queen literally had to move up this 3d thing to get try to get to capture a new gun ray and it's considered one of the best board games of all time and this is a retheme of it which people are saying is not as good now i never got to play the original so i can't compare it but that star wars risk is really good for what it is like it's no twilight imperium it's no eclipse it's no <laughs> star wars rebellion but like compared to risk or monopoly or, or stratego i thought it was really good i really like that game actually like like that's one i can play with my girls and they can get it, right? Like, it's Star Wars It's Star Wars accessible enough to an eight-year-old, which is part of what I like it. And it's strategic enough that, like I said, deciding. It's like, oh, do I want to fight in the space battle, or do I want to try to beat Darth Vader? Oh, I still got to get the moon on Endor down, or I can't blow up the Death Star, and I'm trying to do it all at once. Right. But yeah, it shouldn't be called Risk. Ryan's right. <laughs> Ryan in the chat is saying, calling it Risk is totally mis- misbranding. Yeah. It's got miniatures on a map, and you roll D6s. I, yeah. I think it, that's I mean, enough. It, again, and, and a lot of that, again, is the marketing We've talked about this in previous episodes. If you can tie two major big properties together, that yeah. just increases the, you know, the, the purchasability. You know, mm-hmm. hey, I do have a friend who likes playing Risk in Star Wars, so Star Wars Risk must be amazing. Yes. You know. And it is good, in my opinion. Yeah, Deanna said, so Catan's Risk. No, because you don't, you don't move guys on squares and then attack yeah. guys in other squares to take those squares. Right. I think that there's a better description on it. Right. Yeah, and then no... Uh, so uh, Ryan in the chat room asked, have you backed something on Kickstarter only to have your enthusiasm die for it before even receiving it? Uh, I'm thinking yes, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank on what? So my, my guess for this would be one that I actually lost so much enthusiasm from. I pulled my money before it had even finished uh, the thing, which was that uh, strange Greek odyssey massive oh that thing yes game where we first looked at it uh during our pod during our, our show on uh on kickstarter and yeah. i went and i dropped a lot of money on it uh and then a couple of weeks later we watched an actual play 
and oh, it was so God. obscure and overly complex and 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 it was just it looked like it would make gloomhaven look like a fun fr- family game and i pulled I, my money out that night yeah i do not remember what the name of that game was it was a greek thing right it was yeah. like the, the time of the gods with yeah the yeah, yeah there were all sorts of the odysseus type of thing. titans and yeah you know, yeah, I remember. I remember, and that actual play um, didn't do them any favors. <laughs> yeah, did not. Yeah, yeah. You could mod the minis. I remember that yeah. was part of it. You could, you could like your minis would upgrade and change and yeah. stuff. It, there was some neat stuff going on in that. But yes, oh yeah. I mean, the concept on the Kickstarter page they sold it yeah. well because they got a, a more than a hundred dollars of my money mm-hmm. uh, to back it until I saw it play. I am trying to think of Kickstarters that back that I. Yeah, there aren't too many. I don't think you got, but before Maybe you've I, gotten, that you yeah, that I'm trying to think that I didn't care by the time they. Oh, video game ones. When I first started back in Kickstarter, I, we were talking about this the other day. So yes, there are two video games I backed. I still haven't even booted. I literally have never double clicked on the icon to even play them. Uh, the first was the first. Well, it's the second Kickstarter I backed. The first Kickstarter I backed. Here's a different question. Was by, uh, I don't remember the actors, the the, the artist name, but it was for Maps. And it was back in the day, Kickstarter was brand new. And this is someone who did uh, one inch gridded maps and they did sci-fi ones. And he had done one map that was this like space station. And he had done another map that was a docking bay where the space station would land in it. And he was kickstarting a third map that was another part of the space station that had like a market in it. And this was his third Kickstarter. The other two were delivered. So I felt confident at this point. I'm like, look, person's delivered two Kickstarters before. I kind of want to back this. But what he actually did was he then put out what he called space station tiles. And he took the map basically and cut it into like four by eight squares so you could rearrange it. And that's what I wanted. So I actually wrote him and said, look, that's an add-on item. Like you have to back the Kickstarter to get this. What if you only want that or is there something you can do? And I thought it was really cool because he went and edited his Kickstarter to make that a different backer level. And back then, like stretch goals, no one had even thought of that yet right this is going quite a bit back like i don't like 2014 2015 like kickstarter was still it wasn't the big thing it was now and i backed that i actually got it three months early they showed up the station tiles showed up they were exactly what i wanted you could use wet and dry erase on them i can make various things at the time i was running gamma world it was perfect i was also running star wars d20 worked great um the next thing I backed, now I totally forget what the question was I was answering. Why Why was I going to talk about this? I got uh, distracted. You, that you lost enthusiasm before receiving. Oh, right, video game. That's right. So the next thing I backed was Wasteland 2. So I don't remember the original Wasteland, but I guess that was like a huge um, post-apocalyptic game that, that spawned Fallout. The, the, the Fallout series uses the same engine. Like Fallout 1 is technically Wasteland 2, basically. And this guy was like, he's the original designer. I can't remember his name. He's famous computer RPG designer, not Lord British, but someone else who's really well known. The guy who invented follow whoever he is. And he was going to put out an official wasteland too. So this is, if I didn't do follow, here's where I would have went with the original wasteland story. And I got so involved with that, that I remember going to their party the day they funded and they were all live streaming their office and drinking beers and like sitting there having a beer and cracking it open. Cause that felt like, Oh, I helped make this thing. I don't even know when the game showed up, but it was like two and a half years later. And I was just like, what? Oh yeah. I, I remember back in that. Yeah. Kickstarter was like this new thing. And I felt like I was part of the group that made that happen. I don't tend to get that feeling from Kickstarter anymore. And then I made the silly mistake of them backing shadow run anarchy, which is a, by a similar group that put out the shadow run game. That's again, more like a Baldur's gate style. And I never played it. It's on my desktop. I, that one, I backed it like a high level so that I actually have like the, there's expansions and all this stuff for it. And I have all of that and never double clicked or even started it. Now, what I did do is by backing wasteland two at the time, right when it funded, they gave everyone wasteland one. So at that point I was excited and I did play wasteland one. And I totally forgot it was a game that was designed in the 80s or 90s and that you should hit save before opening every door. And I played for four and a half hours, opened a door to a bar, and then saved. Then continued to get shot by a shotgun that killed my character. That was a trap that you couldn't do anything about. So when I reloaded my save, I just died again. 
And if I reloaded my save, I just died again. There was no way to get back. And I would have had to replay right from the beginning. Because I totally, I remembered, I'm like, oh, wait, I should save. No, sorry, it auto-saved. It auto-saved when I went through the door. Sorry. I didn't choose to save because I totally forgot that in 80s games, you need to tell it to save. And I should have saved before opening the door. And sure, there was probably some hint somewhere that someone was hiding behind the door's shotgun. So it auto-saved when I opened the door and my character died. And then I reload the autosave, and then my character opens the door, and I die, and I die, and I try a bunch of different things. No way to get out of it. And I would have had to start the game over, and I never did. Yeah, that's rough. Definitely. But yeah, that's just, you don't get that anymore, right? Like like games now, when their autosaves are smart enough, they put you back to a safe spot, or they save every hour, or whatever. You just don't see that. And I just, like, I should have known. I grew up playing these games with my dad, where, like, you're about to open a chest, save. You're about to, you're about to go into a building for the first time, save. You're about to spawn a new map save you know about yep. to get on your boat save absolutely uh midge kayla in the chat room saying miskatonic university the restricted collection still sitting unplayed on the shelf yeah i remember that one i could see rpgs uh oh there there's an rpg one tremulous tremulous was um apocalypse world was was the big thing it just hit and everyone was going nuts over powered by the apocalypse well powered by the apocalypse i don't even think was a term at the point i read apocalypse world and at the time, I don't where was I? It must have been G plus some forum where I was reading about role playing games, and this seemed like the new thing, and it seemed very different and foreign to me. And I was not a fan of the sex moves in Apocalypse World. Like that just instantly turned me off. I'm like, this game has sex moves. I don't want to play a game with sex moves. That's not something I want to come up at the table of people I play with. So I instantly discredited Apocalypse World. I'm like, no, no interest in this particular game. But man, everyone's going nuts for this engine. And then. I don't know the name of who produced it because it's been too long, announced I'm going to do Call of Cthulhu as a Powered by the Apocalypse. Well, see, I like the idea and the concept of Cthulhu. I'm not a huge Mythos fan, but I hate the basic role-playing D100 system. So my personal experience with Call of Cthulhu was two extremely bad role-playing sessions that are unforgettable, like just terrible experiences. Part of that being based on the mechanics, more of it being based on the Game Master, but it doesn't matter. Tainted. I didn't want to play Call of Cthulhu, but I was very interested in playing that world and here's this new system that's all narrative driven where it's all about moves and it's not about your character sheet and it sounded awesome it sounded so awesome that i got eight other people in windsor to back it with me and ordered 10 books and so i would have the store got three and then me and a bunch of other people in windsor got copies of this book and we got like a discounted price i've never read the book i literally have not it's downstairs by the time it showed up. Like we were all excited. We were all going to get together and I like, it's a power of the apostle. We didn't even need, need our own copy, but we were all supposed to play so, all six of us. And we were going to run a, a campaign at the local store. No, it's, it's downstairs. Right. Um, mobile frame zero. I actually went out and bought all the dice to be able to play it. Once I read the PDF and that's a game where you make mechs out of robots. Um, it's a updated version of Mechaton, which is the original version, and it uses Lego, or sorry, constructible bricks, whatever, to make Mecha, and there's neat stuff like destroyable scenery and all this stuff. Yeah, I, I went to Origins the year that came out and bought specific dice, and I went and bought Lego for it. Like, we went to uh, the Von Mills Mall, which is the mall closest to Canada's Wonderland, which is the closest place to eat when you don't want to eat in Canada's Wonderland, I and mean, when you don't know the area. I'm sure there's other things, but if you don't know the area, there's a Cracker Barrel there. That's actually Cracker Barrel is actually surprisingly good. Well, there's also a Lego store, which I had never been in one in my life. And they have the brick containers at the end where you just like can buy individual bricks and you can buy, you get like a container that's this big and it's whatever, 12 bucks. And you could fill the container with what you wanted. And there were all these bits that Mobile Frame Zero uses, right? Like these little clips and these eyes and things that, you know, oh, I, buy, I bought a ton of Lego and like I said, at Origins, I literally went, I want seven yellow dice. I want six red D8s. I need three blue D6s because that's how you represented your stats. Never played. I, I did read that one. Yeah, and Deanna's point, we went back with lists to get the ones we missed. <laughs> I never built a mech. Yep. That's, I, that was one that by the time I, I got the physical book, because this was all beast on the PDF. I was doing like the pre-work. to yeah, yeah. When this comes in, I'm going to be ready to play. Yeah, when it came in, I didn't care. That's one I regret. I should do something with that. Like the Lego's all still downstairs. All right. If there's one more question, I think we have time for one more before we move on. All right. Uh, let's do something. Uh, what is from Andrew Black? What is the best Cthulhu themed game? All right. Uh, well, I just went on about how much I don't care too much about Cthulhu. Um, 
Role playing game based on reading it only and not playing, I would say Trail of Cthulhu. It sounds the most interesting. It removed the dead end. The, you didn't find the clue, so you can't continue. Was removed from the game. Robin Laws came up with a system called the Gumsu system, where you get the clue like automatically. Your characters are so competent that as long as you are trained in the required skill, you get the key clue in the scene. It's automatic. Um, but then you do dice for stuff. It's it's got a really unique system. It's got it's resource based where you spend your stats to do things. Has a really good chase system. The problem is all of that information is based on hearsay. I own the book. I've read the book. I we've made characters for it. It sounds great. I've listened to a couple actual plays, but I have not actually seen it played. So, as far as I can tell, to me that blows away the. I, like I said I do not like the basic role playing system that the. The big Call of Cthulhu role-playing game is based on. I've never been a fan of that system. So that's my favorite RPG. And board games, I've got to say Cthulhu Death May Die. Out of all the ones i played, and I've played quite a few different Cthulhu games. There's a lot out there. I really like the fast, furious, throwing dice. Things are on fire. Everyone's going insane. What the heck's going on? One of the characters is killing other characters in the other room because they shouldn't be together. And sean shooting fireballs down the stairs and i like it's just kind of nuts and over the top and i found that a lot of fun compared to your usual move around the board get the right clues collect the right symbols roll the right dice close the gates whatever all, all the elder sign uh what is it arkham horror eldritch horror all of those i did not enjoy um but cthulhu death may die was so great just so over the top uh, it's just a very different feel, and I really enjoyed the feel of that. The miniatures are great and everything else, too, but like the actual gameplay of that I found the most fun out of any of the Cthulhu games I played. Now, he's mentioning Chill, which is not a Cthulhu game. It no. is a mystery horror game. But have they put out Cthulhu expansions for Chill? Not that I am aware of. They didn't for the version of Chill I played. Now, Chill is still going. They, they Chill was a fantastic our... game. I'm not, yeah. I'm not a fan of that genre. I could do it without ever playing another RPG of that type. But if I was going to, Chill is the one <laughs> I'd probably one. mean to. <laughs> yeah. Chill, Chill, the modern Chill, they, they've put it back out. So they have put up a new uh, new version of Chill. They kickstarted it. It's got a new logo. Um, I don't know what they've done. Like, from what I understand, they I think they were purposely trying to distance themselves, going, we are not Cthulhu. Because right. they stuck very much to werewolves, vampires, ghosts psychics like it was all like not not even they didn't even go universal monsters right they went more urban horror like this is stuff that could exist and that was the whole premise of chill was that you are part of a secret society that knows that the monster under the bed is real like that that was the whole premise and you're the men in black right except versus uh, uh, whatever ethereal horrors versus aliens you you were the last defense of humanity and you are the chosen few that have the ability. I even, I, what was it called? It was something like see the unseen or something. Yeah. And every troubleshooter, I think you were called, had the ability to see the unseen. And then some actually had some magic. Others just had weapons. And it, it the game was so great because it played very much uh, down and dirty. Like there, there wasn't the mythic tomes or the portals opening. It was much, to me, much more horrible, more, well, more horrific. Well, the, the, other, the other big focus, one of the big difference, I think, from Call of Cthulhu and Chill is Chill, you are essentially heroes trying yeah. to deal with. You're, not, you're never going to kill all the bad guys, but you're going to kill, oh, this werewolf that's yes. causing a problem in the city. Whereas in Call of Cthulhu, you're going to go insane or, you know, you're going Eventually. to have your mind broken or die. Mm. it's just a matter of how long it takes until you get there yeah realistically and plus in this your heroes as a folk call of cthulhu you're usually hapless people who get toward tossed into something right you're you're investigators and journalists and historians and librarians that suddenly find out about some unspeakable horror and feel the need to do something about it whereas chill was very much no no these things are real and we need to stop them yeah. And and you're being heroic about it. Whereas Cthulhu, your best chance is to run away. Whereas, although it did have that, you couldn't just go face on, which is part of why the system was good. It was all about doing the research. It was all about finding the way to kill the thing. Finding the weakness was pretty much every chill game we ever played was find the thing, for, for, well, find the thing, find out what the thing is, then find out how to kill the thing, then kill the thing was right. pretty much the plots. Yeah, Dracula Delta, Delta Green is one that a lot of people are talking about. I was actually hoping to get into a Delta Green game at uh, 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 
the con this year. Yes, that Origins one. or QCC or, or uh, uh, Breakout. Breakout. That's the one. Yeah, yeah the Breakout. one I was actually going to. Yes. <laughs> Dracula Dossé looked good. That was a whole... That's Delta Green. That's part of Delta Green. Delta Green does use Gunshu. Delta Green is... Um, Jason Bourne meets... Uh, the Call of Cthulhu. Or, or Vampires. Or kind of does all of those. Right. We played a game of Delta Green. But all it was was one quick combat scene. And it wasn't so great. Right. That was more a failing of the quick start rules that someone found online for us to try. <laughs> DM did as good as they could with what they had at hand, I think. It was not a, a great list. So I've never heard of that. The Laundry RPG is based on the Laundry Files series by Charles Strauss. I, I have heard of... Well, I know Charles Strauss. I've heard of the Laundry Files, but I've never read them. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I said Cthulhu RPGs. Is, I said Gumshoe, I wanted to see the system. And I've read it. It sounds fantastic. The rules are presented two ways, which is cool. So you can do Pulp Cthulhu, or you can do uh, Lovecraft Cthulhu. I don't remember what they call the investigative. And you can literally do both. And it basically just depends on how many more investigative skills versus you get versus, like, gun and athletic skills and different ways to play adventures. This one's going to be rough to go through the notes later. Yeah. <laughs> we are all over the place tonight. But yeah, at this point, I think we'll go on. We do have a review to get to. We do have uh, and quite a bit of games played this last week. So thank you, everyone, for your questions. It's greatly appreciated. I'm glad we were able to get some off screen. Like, we did have some people send in stuff ahead of time, so it was nice to be able to, to backlog it. But you guys do rock in, you folk rock in the chat room for coming up with anything you can. So that's it for our April AMA. Th big thanks to everyone who asked a question tonight. We do one of these live Q&As every month on the last Wednesday of the month. So join us next month on the 27th for our end of May AMA. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on gaming advice at the top of the page.